Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today. And I'm going to talk about maintaining vision throughout life. I'd like to start by presenting the case. This 76-year-old man presented to me complaining of the gradual loss of vision in both eyes. Now, this had been present for some time. It was a problem he had ignored for his own reasons, I suppose due to reluctance to see a doctor. Um, and he became increasingly socially isolated as a result. He lived alone in the country. Um, but he was eventually uh, persuaded to see a doctor about it. And when I saw him, he had bilateral advanced cataracts, as demonstrated in this photograph up here, showing his right eye, showing a very opaque lens, such that his visual acuity was hand movements. In his other eye, his visual acuity was counting fingers. This man was blind. So he could navigate his way around his own home, but outside his, his own home, he was lost. So he underwent surgery, straightforward cataract operation, and within a week, he was able to see 20, close to 2020. His vision was restored to normal. It had a huge impact on his quality of life. And this case just demonstrates what we see on a regular basis. Fortunately, most patients are not as advanced as this case. And this is something we really we do not like to see because it's totally unnecessary. But it demonstrates how in most cataract operations you can achieve an excellent outcome and it really can be a life-changing procedure. These are the main causes of vision loss in Ireland. Cataract, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy and age-related macular degeneration. And they affect the vision in different ways. Cataracts will cause general haze in the vision. It can cause a sort of washed out perception of colours. Glaucoma, on the other hand, affects the peripheral vision, where the central vision is maintained until very late in the condition, such that it's largely asymptomatic until very late. Diabetic retinopathy can cause a variety of patterns of visual disturbance, and age-related macular degeneration, in contrast to glaucoma, causes loss of the central vision, such that patients have difficulty recognizing faces, reading text, reading the time on the clock. But the peripheral vision is maintained, and that's very important. If we look at causes of sight loss in Ireland, these four conditions account for about 40% of the causes of visual impairment, and there are many, many in this group accounting for the remainder. Across the world, there are about 285 million people who are visually impaired, of whom 40 million are blind, and about 250 million have low vision or visual impairment. About 90% of the world's visually impaired live in developing countries. And globally, it is actually uncorrected refractive errors, in other words, the need for glasses, that accounts for the main cause of visual impairment. The second most important cause is cataracts. Over the last 20 or 30 years, the World Health Organization has had a huge impact in addressing some very common causes of uh, infectious causes of blindness in the developing world, particularly river blindness, you may have heard of, and trachoma. And in large areas of the world, these conditions have been eradicated. There's also been uh, a huge program to tackle cataract, because as I said, it's a, it's a procedure that yields incredibly um, uh, quick and uh, tremendous results, life-changing life results. So this pie chart here demonstrates that uncorrected refractive errors account for over half of patients' visual impairment in the developing world. Um, and this simply reflects uh, the poverty of these nations and lack of access to spectacles. You can see that cataract is also a huge proportion of these in comparison to our own uh, society where cataract accounts for 3% uh, of visual impairment and macular degeneration is a far more important condition with 26% of, cause of cases. The WHO has a global initiative to eliminate avoidable blindness and is tackling a whole variety of different conditions including cataract, glaucoma, corneal opacification which can occur for various reasons uh, and the infectious diseases I mentioned. And it's important to note that 75% of all visual impairment can be avoided or cured. The National Council for the Blind in Ireland does tremendous work for people who are visually impaired. And this data demonstrates that about 17,000 people access their services each year. And of whom about two thirds of these are over the age of 65. So that's going to become a very important uh, issue as our population ages. And certainly over, I'll show you some figures in a, in a minute, which demonstrate over the next 15 years or so, 
uh, the aging population will be very, become more and more important and the demands on the health service and society in general will need to be met. So a little bit about the delivery of eye care in Ireland. There are three uh, health practitioners that deliver eye care. First of all, there's an ophthalmologist. And this is effectively a, a doctor who is trained in a similar way to a GP or is akin to a GP of ophthalmology. They've done four years of training uh, within the field of medical ophthalmology. An ophthalmic surgeon is somebody who is a registered medical practitioner as well, who has completed a minimum of seven years training in ophthalmic surgery. And generally, ophthalmic surgeons are hospital-based. Optometrists or opticians work in the community, give advice on visual problems and prescribe and fit glasses. And these three professionals provide care to the population with regard to eye conditions. Care is delivered both in the community and in the hospital setting. So in the community, GPs work with community medical ophthalmologists to deliver care. And again, the pressure uh, is mainly within those four areas, diabetes, macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataract. Hospital eye care is delivered largely by consultant ophthalmic surgeons and their team, with some input from medical ophthalmologists uh, on site in hospitals. And they also have a role there in education and training of healthcare professionals. This is a schematic of the eye showing the various um, components. This is the front of the eye here with the cornea, which is the clear window at the front of the eye. Behind this, you have the iris, which gives the eye its color and forms a pupil, which allows light into the eye. Behind the pupil, you have the lens, and that's normally clear unless a cataract develops. This is called the vitreous gel, vitreous cavity. And at the back of the eye, you have the retina, which lines the back of the eye and acts like a photographic film in converting light into sight. This is the optic nerve, which connects the eye to the brain. So returning to the four main causes of vision loss in Ireland, the main questions we'd like to answer are, how can we prevent these happening? Do lifestyle factors play a role in these conditions? If they occur, how can we detect them early to prevent ir irreversible sight loss? And how can healthcare services meet the needs of patients with these common conditions? So at the end of this, uh, I'm going to go through some of the, the common conditions, then I'll, I'll address those questions for you. So cataract is a clouding of the lens in the eye that affects vision, and most cataracts are related to aging, although there are other causes such as diabetes. And by the age of 80, the majority of people have a cataract. And if it's visually significant, then it's important for those individuals to consider cataract surgery. It causes blurring of vision or clouding of vision. Colors can seem faded. And some people will notice glare, particularly at night when driving or else on a bright sunny day in winter when the sun is, is low. Usually symptoms develop slowly over many months. So this demonstrates how cataract can affect the vision causes general haze, loss of clarity, and it can also colors, cause the, the colors to become sort of washed out. The lens changes in size and shape with age. So in youth, it's nice and clear like this. And because the lens is young and elastic, we can change the shape of the lens, allowing us to shift our focus from distance to near. And that's called accommodation. By the time we reach our mid-40s, the lens has become more rigid due to an increase in its density, and that leads to the loss of the ability to alter our focus up close and the need to wear reading glasses. And that happens to everybody. The lens increases in size throughout the years, and it's that that contributes to the loss of elasticity and the need for reading glasses, but it also contributes to the development of cataract with age. This is a normal eye with a clear red reflex. And this is the kind of thing you'll see in photographs, that you'll, you know, family photographs from a distance, that red flash that you'll see on the camera. You can see that if you reflect light off the retina by shining the light directly through the pupil, you get this nice bright glow. But in a cataract, you get loss of that glow. And that's because the density of the lens has increased and you get effectively a dark green development or, or a brown, brunescent type cataract as demonstrated in this picture. And this sort of cataract is completely incompatible with any vision. This patient would probably have light perception vision at best. Cortical cataracts also occur where you get these opacities occurring in the outer aspects of the lens, and these can also be very significant visually. The only treatment for a cataract is surgery, and there has been huge advances in surgery for cataract over the last 15 to 20 years, such that now 
the operation is performed by phaco emulsification. That's the name of the procedure. And this involves using an ultrasound probe that sends waves into the shock waves into the lens of the eye, breaks it up, and allows us to effectively suck it out. And that operation takes about 15 minutes. It can be done through a very small incision in the eye that doesn't require sutures and doesn't disturb the shape of the eye greatly, such that there's a very rapid recovery of vision. Nearly all cases now are done under local anesthetic with the patient fully awake. It's a day case procedure, and in nearly all cases it offers the chance to achieve a very good outcome. And the majority of people are able to see without glasses for driving, probably 80 to 90 percent of people. However, there are some risks. About 1 in 2,000 people will develop a very severe complication, such an infection, and, and blindness can occur. But these are extremely rare events. This just demonstrates how we perform the procedure. We make a cut in the, in the periphery of the cornea here. This measures about 2.75 millimeters. We use this probe, which sends a shock wave into the lens nucleus, breaks it up, sucks it out, and then we can put a lens implant in, in its place. So the anatomy of the eye is restored. So moving on to glaucoma, another very important eye disease. Glaucoma is a group of diseases that damage the eye's optic nerve and results in vision loss through a change in initially the peripheral visual field and then in later stages the central field of vision. And it is usually but not always associated with the high pressure in the eye. It is important to detect this condition early because it is preventable but unfortunately, sight loss and glaucoma is not reversible. Importantly, it's an asymptomatic disease till very late, and it's therefore essential in terms of prevention and identification that people attend to have their eyes examined periodically, with an optometrist preferably. The diagnosis of glaucoma is not always straightforward, and it's based on measuring the intraocular pressure, which is the pressure in the eye, examining the nerve at the back of the eye, and examining the visual field. So who is at risk of, of glaucoma? Well, really everybody over the age of 40. And you can see from these figures that 2.1% of people have glaucoma over the age of 40, and this increases to 3.3% over 70, and probably 6 or 7% over 80. So it's a very, very prevalent condition. It's more common in people with diabetes, and it's more common in people with the family history of the disease in a first degree relative, as well as those of African origin. This is how we check the pressure in the eye using a Goldman applanation tonometer. You may have had your eye pressure checked in the optometrist using an air puff uh, tonometer. We examine the nerve at the back of the eye, and the nerve is made up of about two million nerve fibers called axons. And these axons are from a specific type of cell called a ganglion cell. And this is a healthy, normal optic disc. And it has a rim, which refer to, this is referred to as the optic disc rim, and this is the cup, okay? So all the nerve fibers are crammed together in this rim, very densely packed, and there's about two million of them in a healthy eye. In glaucoma, these cells die, and their axons die with them. And for that reason, you get loss in the thickness of the rim. And in this eye, the cup, which is this pale area in the middle, as it extends right out to the periphery of the nerve, and that is because probably 90% of the axons of those cells have atrophied or died. And that's what you see in glaucoma. It's not always straightforward to make the diagnosis of glaucoma based on the optic disc appearance. This is a normal, healthy optic disc, but this one to the untrained eye also looks normal. But there's an enlargement in this cup which indicates that there's been a uniform um, pattern of axonal loss. Uh, or damage to the retinal cells, these ganglion cells. This is more obvious. That's a very advanced cupped optic disc. There's very little a healthy uh, neuroretinal rim there, and that patient will have advanced visual field loss and probably be symptomatic. Sometimes you get a very localized area of damage to the optic nerve, and in this area you can see the rim is actually healthy here, but down here there's a total loss of the rim. When we do visual field tests, we do a test called the Humphrey visual field, and this is an example of the right visual field, which is healthy. This black spot here represents the physiological blind spot where your optic nerve is located. And then these lines represent 10 degree differences in the visual field. So this measures the central 24 degrees of your visual field. 
The, one of the earliest visual field defects to develop is called an arcuate field defect. So it's an arc-shaped defect in the upper or sometimes the lower visual field. And that's an early arcuate defect. When you have a notch in the neuroretinal rim like this, it typically causes a very predictable visual field defect. This time, when there's an inferior neuroretinal rim loss, you get a superior defect and vice versa. So this is an, a, an advanced superior arcuate visual field defect. In advanced glaucoma, this can occur both above and below the midline, leaving this patient with quite a small central visual field uh, of vision of only about 10 degrees above and across, above and below the midline and horizontally. And this patient may well be symptomatic, but may not. And in fact, many people with very advanced uh, glaucoma, even where the field is this badly damaged, may not be symptomatic. Glaucoma, as I said, affects the peripheral field of vision, and it's amazing how advanced it can be before people notice it. And even in a case like this, unless, unless both eyes are severely affected, the patient may be asymptomatic. So it's a common condition, but it's hugely variable. And it's important for us to be able to evaluate the risk of developing blindness in glaucoma because it's common, but only a small number of people will go blind from it. And we use various factors to determine somebody's risk. And we look at things like the severity of presentation, life expectancy of the patient, and rate of progression. So clearly, if somebody presents at a young age with very high intraocular pressures and badly damaged optic discs, that infers quite a poor prognosis for that patient, even with the best uh, available medical treatment. But in contrast, I saw a lady just a couple of weeks ago, 93 years old, has glaucoma in one eye, moderately damaged. It's of very little relevance to that lady. She's unlikely to live another 20 years. It's a very slowly progressive condition. And we have to take that into account when we're deciding how to manage a patient. And certainly, older people who are like, less likely to be affected by it warrant a less aggressive approach. We measure the intraocular pressure and lowering the pressure, medically or surgically, is the only way we can manage glaucoma. This is an example of the eye after glaucoma surgery. And only a small minority of patients require surgery to control the intraocular pressure because we have lots of different drugs now that are very good at doing that. Probably 20 years ago, we only had a couple of drugs. Now there's at least 10 are very effective and you can use combinations of agents. So only a small minority of people require surgery. And the surgery involves making a cut, first of all, in the mucous membrane coating the eye, which is the conjunctiva I'm pointing to here. And then we make a trapdoor type incision in the sclera, which is the wall of the eye, to allow the fluid in the eye to slowly percolate out in a controlled fashion. And it forms this kind of blister or bleb on the surface of the eye under the eyelid. And it's a very effective way of controlling the pressure in those who don't respond to medicines alone. Moving on to age-related macular degeneration, extremely important condition, perhaps the most uh, important of these conditions these days with the aging population, along with, I would say, glaucoma. It's a common eye condition among people over 50. It's the leading cause of vision loss in older adults. And what happens is it gradually destroys the center of your retina, the part that you use for your clear central vision. There are two types, there's dry macular degeneration and wet macular degeneration. In the dry AMD, it tends to present slowly and progress slowly, so that most people with this condition are fine. Wet macular degeneration, in contrast, can present quite quickly over a matter of days or weeks and damage the vision very, very rapidly. Fortunately, the wet macular degeneration is far less common than the dry. This, these are pictures of dry macular degeneration showing the kind of changes that we see. So you get what we call atrophy, or loss of all the healthy cells within the macula. That's this area of the retina, and it's this part of the retina you use for your clear central vision. That's called the macula. You can get pigment deposition there as well. And these changes represent generalized atrophy, <coughs> age-related, effectively death of the retina at this location, leading to a large area of blindness within this visual field. The rest of the retina, however, is normal. So the peripheral vision is intact in AMD. And that's very important, because while macular degeneration can cause blindness, it does not cause complete blindness. 
So the pa badly affected patients are, are still able to, for example, navigate without a white stick. In wet macular degeneration, you get bleeding under the retina, and that can cause very rapid visual loss. You can also get a waterlogging effect in the retina. Here's some more pictures showing blood underneath the retina. <coughs> At the end stage of wet macular degeneration, you can get a lot of scarring. And in this sort of case, the whole central retina around here is badly damaged, and no vision will arise from this area. So who is at risk of AMD? Well, the risk increases from the age of 50 upwards, and it's certainly more common in smokers, and smokers who do get macular degeneration tend to progress quicker than non-smokers. Family history is, irrele is relevant. Caucasians are at a higher risk than those of African descent. And there is an association between high blood pressure and high cholesterol and macular degeneration. In dry macular degeneration, often there are no symptoms in the early stages. It can be very subtle. It can cause gradual loss of central vision over time, over many months or years, such that patients might have difficulty reading. In wet macular degeneration, it can be quite rapid in onset over days or weeks, and it can cause distortion of the vision. We use this grid, which is printed on a page, it's called the AMSLR grid, for patients to self-assess their central vision. This is what it looks like. So you should be able to see all those lines as a neat, regular grid, and all the lines are straight and uh, normally separated. In macular degeneration, you'll get distortion of the, of the central part of the field, leading to this sort of distortion pattern on the AMSLR grid, as well as what's called a central scotoma, in other words, a blind spot within the center of their vision. And that's what appears with AMD. And patients can have a look at this sort of grid themselves periodically to assess if there's any change and then see their doctor if they feel there is. In AMD, as I said, the central vision is lost and this can be very distressing for patients. We now know that multivitamins can help patients with macular degeneration. A study from the USA found that patients taking high doses of antioxidants and zinc could reduce their risk of developing AM, advanced AMD and experiencing severe vision loss. This supplement needs to contain vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, zinc and copper in very specific amounts. And it's called the AREDS formula. And they demonstrated that this formula benefited people with advanced dry or wet AMD in one eye and intermediate dry AMD but it did not benefit those with early AMD or no AMD. So while many people may take it in the absence of any abnormality and it causes little harm, there's no proven benefit in that scenario, although people with these types of macular degeneration definitely benefit as demonstrated in clinical trials. Now, when I started training in ophthalmology in the late 90s, there was no treatment for macular degeneration. Patients were seen and diagnosed and sent for uh, a low vision assessment and advised on the use of low vision aids, magnifying aids and so on. But there was no treatment to prevent progression of the condition. We now have a treatment called anti-VEGF therapy. And VEGF stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. And it's a little chemical that's found in the eye in macular degeneration. And you can inhibit this by injecting an anti-VEGF monoclonal antibody into the eye. I've also demonstrated in the previous slide how vitamin supplements can help. Now, unfortunately for dry macular degeneration, there is no treatment other than the prescription of low vision aids and magnifiers to help patients read. We do refer people to the NCBI, where they provide an excellent service and support services for patients. It's important also that people stop smoking. This is how the anti-VEGF therapy is delivered. We do wear gloves, <laughs> unlike as demonstrated in this photograph, <laughs> taken off the internet. <laughs> and um, it's a sterile procedure performed in the operating room. And a very, very fine needle, 30 gauge needle is used. And a tiny volume of the drug is delivered inside the eye. And it takes just about a minute to perform this under local anesthetic. It doesn't hurt. And this procedure is done usually monthly for a few months. And then after that is tailored to the specific need of the patient, depending on how they've responded. But many people will end up having six or eight injections, maybe over the course of two years, for example. It's not without risk, but the risks are very rare and certainly not as bad as uh, pro the progression of the condition. 
Now, the final condition is diabetic eye disease. Now, diabetes is a group of conditions characterized by high blood sugar level, either because a person does not produce enough insulin, which is the type 1 seen in younger individuals, or because the cells of the body do not respond to insulin produced, which is type 2, and more commonly associated with obesity. And sight loss occurs in diabetes, uh, can as, uh, be as a result of cataract, as I described earlier, but more commonly as a result of retinopathy, where the diabetes uh, damages the blood vessels in the back of the eye, or indeed glaucoma, because diabetes is a risk factor for the development of glaucoma. And a positive family history increases your risk of developing diabetes. And there are lots of different changes that can occur, but they primarily result from changes in the blood vessels in the back of the eye, which become especially leaky, leaky leading to waterlogging in the retina, damaging its structure, or else the blood vessels close down, leading to an impairment of blood flow in the retina, and again, an impairment in visual function. There are 191,000 diabetics in Ireland, estimated. It accounts for 3.6% of blindness and is the leading cause of vision impairment in people of working age. There are 5,525 cases of treatable retinopathy and maculopathy. Over the past 10 years or more, we have been lobbying to develop a national care pathway and this has finally commenced. So about 18 years ago, a diabetic retinopathy screening program commenced in Ireland, which is a huge step forward. And this care pathway involves the referral of all diabetics from their GPs, clearly with the patient's consent, by GPs, public health physicians and endocrinologists, so that their details are kept on a central database. These patients are then contacted on an annual basis, and they have photographs taken of the back of their eye. The photographs are then graded or evaluated by a trained technician who is trained to identify um, changes that are suggestive of sight-threatening disease. And they are then referred on to an ophthalmologist who will assess them, diagnose them, and commence treatment if necessary. And this is a huge step forward for us. So what, what problems do we face in Ireland relating to vision loss? Well, there are 225,000 people in Ireland who are blind or visually impaired. And this has huge personal, social, and economic impact. And this table here shows some quite startling figures around population, anticipated population growth over the next 10 to 15 years. So currently our population, well, in 2011 at the last census, was 4.738 million people. It's anticipated that by 2026, this will rise to 6.07 million, or a 28% increase, which is enormous. And if you look at what cohort of the population that is going to increase most, it's the over 65s. So you get a 54% increase in 65 to 70 year olds, an 80% increase in 75 to 80 year olds, and a 100% increase in those over 85. And this will clearly have a huge impact on the prevalence of these conditions that I've just described, which are all age-related. So we expect that by 2020, there will be 272,000 people blind or visually impaired based on these estimates, or an increase in 50,000. So we need to lobby the government to commit more finances to the prevention of visual impairment over the next decade. What are the impact on health services? Well, people with vision loss are up to eight times more likely to fracture a hip. And in fact, it's well established that people over the 80 don't tend to die of cancer, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease, as you might expect. They actually die of seemingly more mundane things. The very elderly die following falls. And falls are much commoner in people with vision loss. So these are the sort of figures that people may not realize. But the very elderly are very exposed to vision loss. Elderly with vision loss are three times more likely to be depressed, and they are admitted to nursing homes up to three years earlier on average. The cost to the state increases significantly if a person progresses from visually impaired, where it costs 1,700 euro per annum, to being blind, which is 21,000 per annum. So resources need to be improved through the efficient use of existing resources and increasing other resources as needed. If we look at eye care expenditure and proportion of total health expenditure in Ireland, in 2011 the HSB budget was about 13.5 billion, and I think it's less, it's around 13 billion now. And at that time, the overall percentage that was spent on eye care health was 1.1%, or approximately 150 million. 
if you contrast this to Australia, which is often heralded as having a very good health system, their eye health budget was 2.4% of the overall budget, which was proportionally much larger than we spend on health. But the financial burden of vision loss isn't related just to the cost of delivery of healthcare in ophthalmology. In fact, that only accounts for less than a third of it. If you look at these factors, the health system costs in 2015 around 130 million. But then there's loss of production, 60 million, through the inability to work or, or other factors. Informal care. Many people are cared for by relatives and friends who receive nothing financially in return for this. But that has a cost. Deadweight welfare loss like a, are, are amount to 113 million. So the total financial cost of vision loss is in fact around 420 million. And that will increase to 450 million as estimated by 2020. So you think of the health system costs as being this figure. But in fact, that's only 30% of the overall financial burden of vision loss when you take into account welfare losses, productivity losses, and informal care costs. And all of these will increase pro proportionally over the next uh, 10 years, each by around 10 to 20%. In 2013, we started a clinical program for eye care. And the aim of this program is to move towards the elimination of avoidable sight loss, to rebalance the focus on prevention and early intervention, to provide equitable access to efficient and high quality care supports and treatment, to develop care pathways for the main eye conditions. We've see seen one in diabetic retinopathy. We need to develop care pathways in the other three important diseases. And we need to decentralize care so that more care is delivered in the community rather than in the hospital setting. To achieve these objectives, we need to coordinate and integrate our services. We need to focus on prevention and early intervention, enhance knowledge and awareness in the general public. We need to perform more research to improve outcomes for patients and develop new diagnostics. And we need to provide support for patients in the community. We need to coordinate greater screening of high-risk groups, like patients with diabetes, as we are doing in the care plan. Provide more funding to hospital and community ophthalmology to reduce waiting lists, for example, for cataract surgery. Now, cataract surgery is well established as the procedure that yields the highest value of all interventions in medicine. And if you look at a, a, a factor called QALYS, Q-A-L-Y, which defines the improvement in quality of life in relation to the cost of delivering healthcare, cataract surgery trumps everything else by a factor of dozens. So that operation, which takes 15 or 20 minutes, it's a low-cost procedure, achieves enormous gains, not just for the individual, but for society. We need to encourage all higher citizens to undergo regular eye examinations with an optometrist, promote the clinical importance of mild visual impairment, not accept that. We need to accept that even mild impairment impacts on patients' qualities of life. We need to target earlier treatment of eye diseases, such as macular degeneration, cataract, and glaucoma. How can you look after your own sight, and what can you do individually? Well, it's important to have regular eye checks, and I think you should see an op optometrist at least every two years to have your eyes examined. And if you're older, perhaps over 60, you should see them perhaps every year. It's important that you don't smoke. As I said, smoking increases the risk of macular degeneration, cataracts. It's important to have a healthy uh, weight, not to be obese. Uh, I've mentioned diabetes but also it can affect the risk of cataracts. Keep fit, exercise regularly, monitor and control your blood pressure and your cholesterol. And these are all very important messages. Eat a healthy, balanced diet, five a day you'll all be aware of, of fruit and vegetables. The antioxidant lutein protects from cell damage in the retina and is present in high qualities in these vegetables, kale, spinach, yellow vegetables like sweet corn. Omega-3 fatty acids, you'll, many of you will be aware of, do protect uh, against dry eye problems, they might help in uh, AMD, but that's unproven. And these are present in oily fish like tuna, mackerel, trout, salmon. Protect your eyes from the sun. Wear sunglasses, wear sunscreen. Eye tumors affecting the eyelids are very common, basal cell car carcinoma. And you can also get cancer on the surface of the eye from exposure to excessive ultraviolet light. So wear your sunglasses. If you work in an area where your eyes are at risk from injury, for example, in construction, it's very important to consider wearing uh, goggles when you're at risk. 
So returning to our four main causes of sight loss, how can we prevent these from de developing and do lifestyle factors play a role in these conditions? If they occur, how can we detect them early on to prevent early, uh, irreversible sight loss? And how can healthcare services meet the demands and needs of patients with these common conditions? So let's answer those questions. Well, certainly lifestyle factors do play a role in these conditions. So emphatically, the answer is yes. So look at your own lifestyle, diet, exercise, weight, smoking, they're all important factors in maintaining healthy eyes. Can we detect them early to prevent irreversible sight loss? Well, yes, you should have your eyes checked regularly. If you're under the age of 60, probably every five years is sufficient. After that, certainly every two years or even every year, because really the risk of developing glaucoma, macular degeneration and so on increases exponentially after the age of about 50. Consider your own risk factors. You know, if you have a family history of those conditions, get them checked more often. If you have a history of diabetes, if you're in an at-risk group based on your ethnicity, uh, then consider it more frequently having your eyes checked because your risk will be greater than the general population. How can healthcare services meet the needs of patients with these common conditions? Well, that is a huge challenge and it's for us to lobby the government to put more funding into uh, eye care services because visual impairment has a huge impact on society. We've recently developed this clinical program in ophthalmology and we're making strides forward. We've developed this care plan for diabetes, which is really important and will have a huge impact in the coming years. We then need to focus on the other conditions. We need a cataract care pathway so that more patients can access surgery quicker instead of waiting six to 12 months on waiting lists, which is entirely unacceptable. We need to develop pathways around glaucoma, the det early detection of this condition, preventing sight loss with, with treatment. And we need to look at macular degeneration, not only new treatments through uh, new research, but also delivering the care needed in an efficient and cost-effective fashion. We're all members of the Irish College of Ophthalmologists, all ophthalmologists and um, ophthalmic surgeons. And if you want more information, you can find lots of information on this website. You just need to look up the Irish College of Ophthalmologists. There's lots of other informative websites, for example, uh, the NCBI, which is the National Council for the Blind in Ireland, the National Eye Institute in the USA, which is a leading research institute and provides lots of information for patients, Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is a world-famous eye hospital in London, as well as the Royal College of Ophthalmologists or the Royal National Institute for the Blind in the UK. Thanks very much for your attention. Just the four questions. I'd like to point out that tea and coffee will be served at the end of the meeting. Thanks, Vincent. I have a, a question about AMD. You mentioned yeah. the two different types, the wet and the yes. dry. Um, are the, the treatments, are they cures or are they just prevention from the condition getting worse? They will, in, it, first of all, there's only a treatment for the wet type. And the treatment for the wet type aims to stabilize the condition to prevent further sight loss, but in some people it leads to an improvement. We can't guarantee to everybody that will lead to improvement. And in some people it doesn't work at all, unfortunately. A small percentage of people will not respond to the treatment. So the aim is really to prevent further progression. Now that's realistically what a patient should be expecting to get or hoping to get out of the course of treatment. Um, it doesn't cure it. It's sort of, it's an ongoing management. And in many cases, it can require treatment for two or three years with these injections periodically. So we have yet to find a cure. And ideally, what we'd like is to be able to provide a treatment that instead of lasting just a month or six or eight weeks, that lasts six months. And ideally, patients should attend, have an injection, that's the course of treatment, return in six months for a second injection if need be. At the present, giving repeated injections on a monthly basis is it. Is, is a huge uh, difficulty for, for a lot of people. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the management of glaucoma, and it's about um, the incidence of uh, failure with, to manage glaucoma with uh, drops over yes. a period of time. I mean, it's personal, uh, but yeah. uh, I've been under treatment of drops for about 10 years, and then by this time last year, went off the scale altogether, and my ophthalmologist said, look, it's attractive. For you, yes. Which I've done. And it's just really gotten very bad in the last year or so, and it's going ground. And mm -hmm. then it went off the, you know, the scale, this pressure thing 
Oh, 27 or something, one eye or something. Yeah. Crazy thing that that's why is that very common? That happens, yeah. I mean, that, that can relate to perhaps the progression in the glaucoma. Yes. Uh, you know, the, uh, well, the increasing difficulty. Yeah. yeah, so you respond for a period, it might be several years, and, it, uh, and the pressure can go up again either because the glaucoma has gotten worse, so there's less drainage of fluid from the eye, and the, the treatment has just continued to work at the same level, or the effect of the treatment has worn off. And there is a well described mechanism for medicines called tachyphylaxis, which means the effect of a drug just wears off over time. So there's certain glaucoma drops do demonstrate tachyphylaxis, which is where literally it stops working, and it's unexplained why that occurs. But it is a feature of glaucoma. The position you've been in is not uncommon. And that's why regular monitoring is important. Oh, you know, that's, yeah, uh, yeah, that's I mean, why. When the thing went as bad as it did, they sent me brought sort of brain scans and everything to see yeah. was there something else going on. Yes. Um, but it, it's, it's quite <coughs> traumatic. Really. It, it, yeah, absolutely, it can be. And, and the difficulty is it's not always straightforward. I mean, I've described how you, you, know, you know, take a history from the patient, you examine their optic disc, you measure the intraocular pressure, you, do, you check the visual field. And it sounds very logical. You put all those pieces together and here's your answer. It isn't always like that. Assessing the optic disc can be difficult. Um, identifying if it's changed or if it's abnormal and normal. It can be difficult to know what pressure you should try and achieve. There's this concept of a target pressure in glaucoma. The normal pressure in the eye is 10 to 21. But in glaucoma, the specific target, what should we get the pressure to, is very much individualized. So what is good for one person, and we could say to somebody with glaucoma, the pressure is 16, that's great, that's well within the normal range. That might not be good enough. It might actually need to be 14 for them or 12. So that's where it has to be individualized, and that's where it's more of a you know, medicine can be a bit of an art at times. Yeah, I'm not yeah. complaining, but I'm just I know I'm that, sort of yeah. aware of this, that yes, girls yeah. are going to go. I'm That's quite, it's it's quite it's normal, and it's a, it I happens. Think it's just it's a bit of trauma. Yes, yeah, it is very difficult, so I can understand. Yeah. Yes? Um, can I ask just uh, on the pressure, um, depending on the equipment people use, you can get a different range. So yes. Yes. What they are, when you should be concerned about when they disappear and when they come back. Well, there are several, for, well, the first question, there are several ways to measure the pressure. So optometrists will use an air puff me method. And that's a very good sort of screening method. It's simple to do. It doesn't require any anesthesia or drops or anything. It takes a second, and there's your reading. It isn't as reliable as the very standard one that's used in, in, by ophthalmologists called Goldman tonometry. And some optometrists will use that method. But it does involve putting drops in the eye. It's a little bit more of an ordeal. So the gold standard is Goldman tonometry. So theoretically, at least, if the machine is calibrated properly, which it should be, the, measure, the pressure, if you have it checked in Los Angeles, it should be the same in Dublin, or in the eye near hospital or the matter hospital. It should be the very same with that method. However, there are several other methods, and they may not correlate. So the gold standard is, is Goldman tonometry, and that's what's done for any patient with glaucoma. The other methods are just for detection, for screening, really not for monitoring. So that's the pressure thing. And the second question was floaters. So floaters are extremely common. And in fact, everybody has floaters. If you stare at a blank wall like that for long enough, you will see floaters. I showed you a picture at the very beginning of, uh, I'll go back to it, of a, um, the gel. Um, let me just find it here. This picture here. So. This, this area is called the vitreous, and this is made up 99.9% .9 of water, but it has little bits of protein and other components within it. And they float about, and you can see those because they cast a shadow on your retina. In most circumstances, you're not aware of them, but if you stare at a very, very blank object like a white wall, you will see little floaters, and that's normal. In, in about half of people, eventually, this gel collapses. So you get little pockets of fluid within the gel, and as we get older, those pockets coalesce to form larger pockets. And eventually you can get a very large pocket which breaks through between this very thin membrane at the back of the eye that separates this gel from the retina. And that causes the gel to collapse. And that's called a posterior vitreous detachment. So that happens to about half of people eventually. And in some people when it happens, you get the sudden onset of flashing lights and floaters. Okay? And that usually is very noticeable to the patient and they'll present to their doctor and be examined. 
And it's important that in that situation that you are examined, because when the gel collapses like that, it can tear a hole in the retina, and that's how a retinal detachment occurs. So it only occurs in a tiny minority of people with this posterior vitreous detachment, but it's important to be examined to make sure that it's not developing. But for most people with floaters, particularly if they're there for a long time, they're very innocuous or insignificant. It's only really the posterior vitreous detachment is a significant thing that needs to be examined because a very small percentage, probably less than 1%, will develop a retinal detachment from that. There are a few other causes that are important, such as inflammation in the eye that can cause floaters. Again, you'll see that in younger people, and it's usually associated with blurring of vision, such that as a patient or as an individual, you'd become aware of a problem. So that's really it. A lot of them are completely normal, physiological, everybody gets them. Then there's this posterior vitreous detachment thing, which is common, and very rarely can cause a retinal detachment, and that requires attention. And then there's a few other unusual causes, but usually have other symptoms, so it's unlikely they'll cause difficulty for you. Yes? Eye exercise, yeah. uh, such as what? So Is there? Um, I mean, there are specific eye conditions where you have difficulty maintaining convergence of your eyes. Okay, and that is so when you're reading or looking at anything up close, it's important your eyes converge a little bit. Okay, um, and there's a condition called convergence insufficiency where y your your brain just doesn't bring your eyes close enough together and you get a form of double vision from that. And there are exercises you can do to improve that. But if you don't have a specific condition like that, I'm not aware that eye exercises uh, are helpful. Yeah? Is there any link between premature birth and the eye you mentioned? Well, certainly premature birth can cause a variety of eye conditions, but none of these, particularly retinopathy of prematurity, which is something that's screened for in premature and low birth weight infants. Uh, but none of these particular conditions. Yeah. I recently had my eyes tested when I was told that um, I had dry eyes and my eyes were sometimes a bit quite uh, like sand to my eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's extremely common, particularly in middle-aged women. You know, probably a third of middle-aged women don't produce enough tears. So most dry eyes due to an inadequate tear production, okay? And it's more common in women because of hormonal reasons. Um, and then a tiny minority of people with that have an underlying condition. But if you're otherwise well, it's very likely just an age-related problem and just take some, some uh, drops across the counter. Um, there's lots of available without prescription and you put them in three or four times a day, and most people that's sufficient. If you need to use them more often than that, in other words, the effect wears off after an hour or two, then you need to use preservative-free artificial tears. And again, they're available over the counter in pharmacists. But it's a very common problem generally, and usually managed easily with a few drops. Yeah. It's just a question, um, how do you refer yourself to an optometrist or an optometrist? Well, you can see an optometrist because they're available in the community. So you can just go to your local optometrist and um, they will examine you. Um, they'll do a sight test, tell you whether you need to wear glasses, and they'll also do a thorough examination. Some of them do visual field tests and a variety of other things. But their role is really to um, do a sight test, examine your eye health, um, advise you on eye health, and identify if there's anything wrong. Um, and they will all do that very, very efficiently, very effectively. And if they find a problem, they'll refer you to your GP or to an eye doctor. Um, I think that's preferable to going to see an eye doctor straight off or even, or alternatively, if, you know, go and see your GP. But often the optometrist is the best person if you have some concerns. Um, with, I think with the advice of your GP as well, notwithstanding the fact that certain conditions of the eyes can be related to other, your other medical history. Uh, in which case, you're certainly your GP is best to, to, in a position to advise you on that. Yes? I, I have a friend who has two detached retinas. Right. Uh, he has a very well developed taste for Bushman's whiskey <laughs> and also he smokes. Right. Uh, I, I don't know if there's any kind of relationship, particularly between the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> no, there isn't, actually. No. no. <laughs> None. <laughs> yes? Um, there's, well, there's quite a number of different procedures described and it's difficult for me to comment really. I don't perform those procedures myself. I'm aware of the literature, but I think if you're thinking of having it done, you need to see a specialist and get their own advice. They can tell you about their own personal results and outcomes and give you much more specific sort of information around, 
uh, around expected outcomes. But there are several procedures described. Uh, I wouldn't be able to m be more specific, and, uh, considering I don't do it myself. Um, there is not, no, no. The two conditions are not associated, fortunately, because if you can imagine that AMD causes loss of your central vision, glaucoma causes loss of your peripheral vision. If the two occur together, it's quite devastating because it will lead to total blindness. So fortunately, we don't often see them together, um, but except that they're both common in the elderly, so we do occasionally, but they're not connected. Can I ask one Yes. It's a different type of material used. Um, the gel stays around longer, so uh, it's probably more f efficient in people with more severe. So in a very mild dry eye, you can use effectively what are like saline drops. Um, so saline being sort of salt water drops. So it has a very watery consistency, and that's good for a mild dry eye. But if your dry eye is more severe, there are various gel type uh, treatments that uh, stay around for longer. And so it's probably more effective for people with moderate or severe dry eye. Uh, just how do you feel about glasses, wrap around glasses that have uh, the side of the eyes um, blocked out? You just small vision. If somebody's dry eye, say they're out walking or even if they're driving, does that affect um, the eyes? The wind? Yeah, I mean, that can, be, that can, can help, I suppose, if the wind is irritating your eyes, either because they're dry or because your tears aren't draining, because the wind can cause watery eyes as well, then certainly if it'll stop the wind blowing into your eyes, there may be some benefit. But the water isn't driven by dry eye, it's purely the wind causing a watery eye. Yeah, the, the, the in wind, yeah, no, there is, the wind is irritating your eye effectively, so I suppose if you can keep the wind out by wearing those glasses, then that might be of some, some benefit, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just one, one last Sorry. Uh, yes. Connor, first of all, thanks Martin. very much for taking the time to come and talk. You're very to welcome, Martin. Both of you, as much appreciated. I know you're busy. Just wondering, <coughs> looking to the future, I mean, at the moment, if the retina is damaged, that's irreversible. What's your thought about the future in terms of stem cell therapy and you know, the possibility of actually uh, you know, repairing the retina? Well, there is a lot of work in stem cell therapy. And in fact, it wasn't that long ago that stem cells were identified within the retina for the first time. So stem cells are pluripotent cells. In other words, they can be converted into different cell types. You can manipulate them and do a lot of different, uh, apply different treatments to them to, to encourage them to develop into a specific cell type. So if you took a condition like glaucoma, I mentioned that ganglion cells get damaged, they're ir irreversibly lost and cannot be replaced. But you could imagine how in the future, hopefully, we'll be able to apply a treatment that will encourage a stem cell in the retina to develop into that type of, type of cell or the photoreceptor cell is the cell that's used to convert light into sight. And those are the cells that are damaged in macular degeneration and diabetes and a variety of conditions. So you could see how potentially, you know, in the very long run, that there isn't anything to demonstrate that demonstrates that that's possible now. But uh, based on work done with stem cells in other areas of medicine, uh, then there may be something in the future that can be applied to, the, uh, to, the, to eye disease at the back of the eye.